Good afternoon and welcome. It's 3 o'clock. You've been in sessions now since 9 a.m. So I promise to keep you alive and engaged. And we also have a special guest today. Jordan Schroeder will be joining for a, an action-packed Q&A session. And we're going to really get into some of the details. I'm going to start with some of the higher level uh, principles of security awareness. Um, my name is April Sather. I work for First West Credit Union, British Columbia's third largest credit union, with 54 branches and 1,700 employees. I'm responsible for IT governance, risk, and compliance, as many in this room are as well. Uh, and uh, you know, this is one of the pieces, the security awareness piece, that we find is uh, we've really made great strides over the past three years and are quite proud of our program. That said, it is a work in progress. So I wanted to take a quick check in the room of how many people here actually have security awareness programs in their organizations today. Fabulous. So we're looking at about 85%. How many feel that their programs are successful and effective at changing and actually influencing user behavior in the desired way? So let's say perhaps 30%. So there's a gap. <laughs> it's one thing to have a program, to launch a program. It's another thing to keep it alive, make it meaningful, and actually to keep up with the evolving threat landscape. So, you know, one of the themes I've heard throughout this conference is the importance of being pragmatic in all that we do and really recognizing that security awareness programs need to coexist with the business to demonstrate this is risk mitigation, but it's also business enablement. Uh, it, it, there's a sense of, actually there's a real need to market this in a, a compelling way. So there is something called the why that I'd like to start with. And I'm going to ask for some guesses right now as to what the average cost is to a fair-sized organization um, on the global scale for a single breach. Does anyone have a sense? Not per record, but overall. Hint, it's over a million. 3.8 million. Per record, uh, over the past two years, that cost uh, per, has gone up uh, by 6%. It's moved from $145 in 2014 to $154 per compromised record. And if that isn't a business case for a security awareness program, I don't know what is. Because one of the things I think we all struggle with is getting budget for all things related to security. And when we look at the business case around data theft, IP theft, and even, of you know, course, systems downtime, uh, that is uh, a clear, compelling statement. So when we look at the problem, we, the users, actually are that problem. 75 to 90 percent of breaches, depending on which study you read, are, need humans to succeed. Whether that's social engineering, whether that's letting people into your data center who actually shouldn't be there, uh, we are the issue. So when we look at process and technology mitigation, such as firewalls and antivirus, that's just part of the solution. An important part, but certainly not uh, the whole picture. So the security awareness program focuses on the people. The process seems pretty simple. You design a program, you educate your users, you test whether they got it, and you repeat it. But the iteration, the pace at which the cycle is moving, is it's very intimidating and it can actually be paralyzing so you end up with the same stale program whereas things have moved ahead and the users know it and they're not really hearing what you're trying to say essentially when you're creating a, a program you are the architect so I, I was thinking about this in the context of building a home and there's a lot of requirements uh, and it depends you know really what are you protecting what do your clients value? You really can't afford to protect everything equally in the same sense you aren't able to protect um, and actually train with the same amount of focus on everything. So being able to distill to the essence the most important design elements is key. So when I'm thinking about this, it's kind of holistically, there's some organizational priorities and then there's the end user realities. So organizational priorities from financial performance, to meeting consumer needs, uh, of course regulatory and audit, but interestingly, and I think one of the biggest challenges is around ensuring smooth operations. You don't want to slow things down. And there is a perception in an image, uh, and one that you know, we're always kind of, kind of balancing is 
security awareness is fine as long as you can still call help desk and get your password reset with no authentication. Or it's, <laughs> it's fine as long as you're not the one inconvenienced. Uh, and that's one of the things is part of the education is, yes, there might be a little bit more inconvenience, but without that, you're just not going to be a secure enterprise. So end users have diverse values. Uh, you know, people have ways of managing their home technology ecosystems that are going to be brought right into the workplace. And you know, one of the things that we've discovered and that I know that's in Jordan's book is appealing to people and how they will benefit personally from becoming more securely aware that will translate into them actually making those same behaviors commonplace in the workplace. The other reality is time is scarce, priorities are many, and people are overloaded with information. So how do you make your 30-minute webinar or your uh, presentation or your workshop something that people don't dread going to, don't avoid, or don't actually pretend to have completed? So one way to create this engaging program is not to do it by yourself. In fact, if at all possible, having someone outside IT actually be the champion of the program and a spokesperson, it's a pretty good idea. So when you look at other areas, there's risk, there's compliance, there's operations, marketing, HR, there's all of these different departments. And you might say, boy, it's going to take a long time to meet with everyone and try and explain what I'm doing. But boy, is that worth it. Uh, first of all, you're going to be getting kind of the real goods on how good your program is. And you're also going to perhaps find some shadow champions who will partner with you so you aren't on your own. You know, in exchange for that, you might have to incorporate some bits and pieces from their areas. But again, the more support you have from the senior leadership, the better. I mean, without, I mean, we all know C-level support and the board support is mandatory, but it's that next level down where I think the operations folks need to be uh, right alongside. Make it measurable. So without metrics, it's simply intentions. The other plus about having metrics is you're able to prove by having a baseline and then a kind of a, another checkpoint that your program works. And when it works, you get more money. And more money, you can have a better program. So that's kind of the, the motivation around metrics, is to also be very honest about your baseline. As, you know, you might do a phishing, a simulated phishing attack and find that 40% of the staff go for it. <laughs> be proud, <laughs> because actually that's actually just, it's a wake-up call, but then you have something to improve from. If it's all good, then what do you, you're, you're not really making that case that you need to do this. And believe me, if you add up 30 minutes to an hour of people's time across the whole workforce, Someone's making that calculation, so you do want to make sure that it's, uh, you're showing that it's worth it. So co-create. Another principle is around you don't have to do this from scratch. It is amazing what's out there. Sites like Know Before, Fish Me, there are pre-scripted, pre-crafted programs ready to be placed into your enterprise with your branding uh, for very little cost. There's also some um, open source uh, information as well and resources that you can use. But one of the barriers to starting is like, oh, I don't have time. I'm not going to hire someone to create this web content and you know, doesn't integrate with my learning management system. And there's many excuses to not doing something kind of cool, like the, um, some of the social engineering attempts. But co-creation is a way to really accelerate things. How many of you are using those types of uh, external tools, like Fishme, you know, before? A handful. And within this deck at the end, there's links to everything. And, and of course, in Jordan's book, I'm sure they have even more. So there's, there's stuff out there to take you there faster. The information security policy. Yes, we all have one. Is it up to date? Does it reflect what you want to do with your security awareness program? They do need to be aligned. So if you look at the basics of having the executive and board sign off, great, that's, that's a must have. But it's hard to under, you can't really overestimate how important that the actual enforceability of this, product, this um, piece of paper is. If you aren't enforcing it, people know. People will, if they see their leader doing something that's clearly against the policy. So for example, USB sticks banned <laughs> where we are. You'll not, you will never see a USB stick at our organization. But if you saw the leaders running around and trading them, that would send a very conflicting message. So very important that you uh, you're actually walking the talk. The frequency of training. Now this, this, this is a bit misleading because let's say you have annual training, but there's a lot more going on within the year than this formal webinar, and we'll be getting to that later. 
it's one thing to know something in theory, but do you know when you're about, when you're um, being fished, that you're falling for it? And you won't know that if you're ready and waiting for it. So the moment you take that web-based training, you get 100%, that really doesn't mean that much if in the moment of choice, you make that wrong choice. Also, just a quick note, uh, be sure to include contractors. Contractors, particularly those in the IT space, have the keys to the castle. And you know, when people come and go, their accounts are often left open or, yeah. oh, well, they, they're coming back in a few months or weeks. They might never come back, but you just completely forget. So keep, make sure that they actually sign and understand this. Education. At the end of the design phase, you will have a plan. You will know what you're focusing on for the year, you'll know how you're measuring it, you'll have to sign off the policy, but if you actually don't do the education phase, you haven't done too much. So there's different messaging for different audiences, and there's three categories of audience. Number one, executives. Number two, IT, and number three, everybody else. So for executives, it's actually, I think a lot of you have heard during the keynote and other presentations today, plenty of board attention on this topic, almost maybe too much, but it's, uh, it's all a good thing. So that is not really the issue. There used to be this plausible deniability where they could say, oh, I didn't, didn't know, this isn't kind of, this is the IT issue, we don't have to be responsible. That doesn't cut it anymore. IT is actually the toughest audience, and I imagine most folks in this room are from or connected to IT. <laughs> Do we have anyone who's not from IT? Good diversity, okay, and, and so <laughs> you're going to be not in this group of the tough people. So what we see is the folks who have the most access, risk, and confidence are the most resistant be to be uh, kind of constrained, uh, both in the way they develop, in the way they test. Uh, there's lots of things where adding that extra layer of security in IT can slow things down. Uh, but at the same time, IT is the first line of defense, so you want them on your side. And it, it, I think when you're doing the messaging, it's not don't do this, don't do that. It's more how do you do things safely? How do you help your users succeed? How do we help you succeed and still um, have a security-aware mindset? So the motto we have here is develop securely, test well, and patch often. Uh, recently, I think it was actually just yesterday, the day before, we posted a white paper on secure development practices. So it's a bit of a survey that was out there um, that Ed Pereira create, created for us. I recommend you check that out and share it with your teams. Patching. So we have Patch Tuesday, there's lots of patches, but boy, the infrastructure team starts to recoil when they realize this is going to take us you know, one or two FTE if we're going to do every single patch. And how do you balance security with risk <coughs> and make it palatable? So there is certainly, there's fair uh, resistance, but at the end of the day, you, you just, you do need to do those patches. Again, protecting what matters most. So data classification, system classification, going through your technology ecosystem and saying, what are the golden jewels? What are the uh, kind of so-so? And then there's a few other areas. More and more, everything kind of counts. But at the end of the day, if you're going to prioritize, protect what matters most. Any questions or thoughts so far? OK. Communicate consistently. So. This is the online hygiene starts at home prospect. Uh, this is, I will give Dominic Vogel full credit for that phrase. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so the idea is these are the habits. And you know, when you look at your mobile devices, you look at all of the different things that you're touching at every moment, you might not be thinking as much as when you're actually in the workplace. And you're just accepting those LinkedIn invitations. They might be phishing attempts. And actually, that's one of the most effective ones uh, that we found when we tested our staff. Uh, the one people see a LinkedIn invite from their executive, who's going to say no without, oh, actually, this is not a LinkedIn invite. Uh, and then again, this co-creation principle is here. Now the fun part. Testing. Now, this isn't the kind of testing when you're going to the webinar and taking the multiple choice. This is using familiar applications and leveraging pre-written content from some of these vendors to see if your users really get it. Now, there is a flip side to this, and some users, I can say from personal experience, feel this is almost like entrapment. And they're feeling like, what are you 
doing? Don't you trust us? How could you do this to us? But then it's all about the way you communicate back to them that actually this is not, we're not here to punish you, we're here to try to help you. And this is actually one of the best ways to learn is participative learning, if you call it that. Uh, so the, but the results are often a huge wake-up call for executives and staff. It hurts, but then you do recover. It's like a flu shot. So then we have physical bait, and this is a little less, uh, you know, for us examples, USB, no one touches them, we know better, but there's examples of organizations who will just plant USB sticks and see who's going to pick it up and plug it into the network, and then they find out who that individual would be. <laughs> there is organizations that swap out POS devices, because again, that's another opportunity for um, hacking of a different form. And mobile device phone just leaving random devices to see who does what with them. In real life, there's advanced social engineering where you can impersonate executives or others uh, and actually call the help desk and see what you can do. You, there are opportunities to impersonate vendors. This is where a lot of folks get a little bit uncomfortable. So for those of you who've heard of secret shoppers, there are secret engineers. And you can send them in to your organization. They look completely legitimate. Uh, of course, no one's expecting them, but somehow they make it into the data center. So, just something, another advanced technique to consider, especially if hardware is, and you have your own data center. Regulations. You know, this is what drives, let's face it, most of us to create these programs. And at the end of the day, it's good, but it's just not enough. Because when you talk to staff and you say, we have to do this because it's an audit requirement. We have to do it because a regulator told us to. That doesn't really get to the heart and soul of why. It's, you know, when you think about consumers or protecting our jobs or keeping our company uh, intact and our reputation, kind of looking for some of those angles, it is more effective than the regulator. But that said, it's handy. So when we look at regulations, there are certain industries that are traditionally strong and weak. Healthcare, government, financial services on the stronger side. Uh, retail, manufacturing, a little bit on the weaker side. So when you look at that, there's just almost a culture in the organization. People expect there to be stricter controls because they've always worked in, say, financial services. And then they go to manufacturing, like, oh, it's different here. And there is a real culture, a security culture that you do need to recognize is when you're going from organization to organization. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, in this room have had different experiences based on sector. So when we talk about this um, Upstream and downstream, that's a really important piece because 40% of attacks are on small and medium-sized businesses. But ironically, most small and medium businesses, they don't actually feel that they are in the category of folks who would be attacked. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're too small, no one's going to care. But you are the gatekeeper to, you might be a supplier, an outsourcer, uh, some sort of relationship with the bigger companies, and you have ways into their network, and the cyber criminals are well aware. So aside from all the regulation, consumers now completely expect us to be prioritizing their privacy and security. So that, again, is kind of the highest burden of truth. And when we think about the currency of trust, much harder to earn back. And you know, with the speed of social media, people know about breaches in seconds. So the next step, of course, is to actually do something. And you know, this deck, again, all the details of the different vendors and plan templates and all of those, you can find that online. But I thought I'd distill it to the essence of 10 things you could actually do tomorrow. Number one, you're attending this session. So this is a good start. Uh, this is called Do Your Homework. There have, how many are familiar with Securing the Human from SAMS? It is an amazing site. I mean, I couldn't believe how much is there for free. Resources galore. There's checklists, there's plans, there's roadmaps, there's metrics. You really could actually have your entire plan and just go to that site <coughs> as a start. I mean, the execution's all where all the work is, but you can get the templates there. Um, advanced persistent training. Uh, we have the author, Jordan, here with us today. We'll be speaking with him one-on-one. -on -one. He, as a special gift to all of you, uh, will be sending electronic copies of his book, which is on Amazon right now. It is not free, but it is free to you. Uh, and so we're really pleased to be able to share that. And there's a lot in his book that talks to the human motivation and how do you change habits and what can you actually do to incent people to change and become more security aware. Determine the goals of your program. Just sit down and say, what am I trying? If I was to change three behaviors, what would those be? And say, in 90 days, what would that look like? Be really, start simple and actually, you know, the more grandiose the plan, the more likely it is that you won't do it or that everything will change by the time you're halfway through. So think about some immediate goals. Get executive support. 
create a plan and channel your inner marketer. And that's where you're going around internally and building support for your plan and kind of plugging in uh, best practices and ideas from other areas of the business. So it isn't your plan, it's kind of a, a shared plan. Review and update your security policy. That's a quick one. Routinely review incidents at your organization and try to make it into a, in a, a way that people can understand. Very high level. The statistics are fine, but if you want to say, here's the top three things that we're facing, experiencing, this is the number of threats that are, we've been able to deflect, but here's some ones we weren't. And almost owning it, and no need to call out names of who clicked on the phishing email, but just say someone, and this is kind of the impact, and this is what we're going to try and do to prevent that in the future. Choose a tool. So Gartner has a magic quadrant, as they do on everything, it appears, on security awareness and training tools. So check it out. They talk about, you know, if you're looking for something visionary, something basic, uh, there's uh, tools for all levels and all budgets. Test employee understanding through simulation. Agree <coughs> on, track and share the metrics. <coughs> Communicate consistently, briefly with humor. Not everyone's a natural at humor. That's where the YouTube videos come in. You can actually import the humor and just try to make it so that they're short, snappy, appealing to all different generations. You aren't going to find people reading 20 or 30 pages. They'll sign it, but they probably won't read it. So try to get through to them in different, um, different ways. And build in some security five-minute updates into existing meetings, publications, and events so it's not a standalone event where you know, there's a lot of pressure and expectation that it's going to deliver this amazing experience where at the end of the day, you need to be consistent and reinforce the message for it to actually get through to people, like with any change. So we're now going to move over, and I've got a chair for Justin here, and we're going to talk a little bit about some Questions, I have a few, but I really look to all of you here to ask some specifics, too. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my background started off in education, in technology and, and technology education, and my, my career went all over the place, as many people's does, and I ended up in information security, and I discovered that most people tasked with security awareness aren't trained educators, they, they don't have that kind of a background. Uh, for those of you who are involved with your security awareness, how many of you have, how many of you are involved in delivering your security awareness? So that's a lot of you, that's awesome. Uh, keep your hands up. How, uh, put your hands down if, you've, if you have an education or training background. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little confusing. There's most people, most security awareness trainers don't have an education background. They're security folks who've been tasked with training. And they run into this roadblock of, I have the information, I know what the policy says, I know what senior management says, I know what the regulation says, what we need to do, and I can't get my people to do what they're supposed to do. And how do I resolve that? And so I, I took some time, I've, I've been working on uh, security awareness techniques uh, for a long time, and I brought everything together, or well, most things together, into a book written in conjunction with uh, the top security awareness training vendors in the uh, Gardner uh, uh, Magic Quadrant. And they all have a lot of things to share, and there's, there's, there's something there for everybody, and the response to the book has been great. Uh, it's available on Amazon for purchase, paperback, Kindle version is coming, I apologize. Um, it was just published this month, by the way. And like I said, I have, uh, I have a version, uh, an electronic version available for free, and the link will be in a, in a, in a slide coming up. And the email, actually, coming to that. Yeah. And we have three questions, but we, you know, I think part of the, uh, the value of this entire BC Word is getting everyone here involved and engaged. So be thinking of your questions. I'm going to start with my first one. What can I do as an information security professional to increase my skills in educating? Uh, as I said, you're in education, you need the skills in education. Look for train the train the courses, read books on how to educate. But perhaps the more actionable thing, because most security awareness professionals don't do it as a full-time thing, it's a part of their job, 
Look at, and you've used the word many times, look at the marketing skills. Look at the marketing communication, even copywriting skills that are necessary to help communicate not just a change in buy-in and a change in acceptance of what's going on, but a change in behavior. And that's one thing that uh, a trained marketer does very well is gets people to buy, takes the information and gets them to act. And that's exactly we, what we need to do for security awareness. So that's, that's the, something you can do. Uh, I've seen people turn around with very quick success with transitioning to a marketing and copywriting point of view. Um, and the other thing is bring it in. There are tons, and the, and the field is growing rapidly, of qualified people, uh, qualified companies who do security awareness. And that's all they do, and they're willing to come in, uh, provide free materials, help you out, that, and that field, the field is growing very quickly. Recognizing the growth in the remote workforce, both in people telecommuting and the contractors, what are some of the best practices in those environments? They're outside the direct control of IT folks. Um, so how can awareness programs be effective in driving behavior outside the workplace? That's a tricky one. Um, you, like I said, you don't have the control. You don't have a captive audience. You're dealing with people outside. And making some of the security um, mandatory before they're able to connect uh, is one of the ways that you can that that can work having technical controls uh, as well can also provide that that means and because it's outside of your network because you can't control it you can't trust it um, and it's not about not trusting the people it's about not trusting the equipment that they're on um, you have people using their phone in the, in the office and they take it at work they get infected at work with something completely on work related they then bring that mobile device into the office and they they bring that same thing in so it's about containing and placing limits and the boundaries of trust for the things you can't control which are many yeah. okay. so and I, I alluded to this earlier but in some cultures corporate cultures the idea of big brother sending them phishing emails and other forms of perceived entrapment Go, this doesn't go over very well. Have you had success in handling that objection and what, what do you recommend for folks out there? Absolutely. It's probably the number one thing I've heard when it comes to like simulated phishing or simulated social engineering. Big brother entrapment, it's a problem. And frankly, it is. If you think about it, if I send a test to you and there's only two possible responses, punishment or no response whatsoever, how are you going to feel, right? You're, you're not going to want to engage in that at all. And being forced into it, it's going to feel like punishment and entrapment. Instead, provide a positive alternative. For instance, for phishing emails, you instantly want to record, me provide metrics for, and punish or retrain people who click. What do you do for those who don't? Do you have an alternate means for the right activity? Do you have? and you all should have a phishing awareness inbox, right? So I think this is a phishing, can you please take a look at this? You should have that inbox. So as part of the phishing awareness simulation, you have those who click and those who report, and you need to be able to provide positive reinforcement for those who report. I also very strongly caution against providing punishment for those who click. That is a very touchy situation. Please connect with their HR department and what's necessary. There was a, uh, an article recently from the uh, Department of Homeland Security where they said if there is a senior executive who clicks on a simulated phishing link, they should be fired. I understand the sentiment, I, I get it, but it's not necessarily the best way to run a phishing simulation program. Yes, they might need follow-up, yes, they might need some training again, but be very careful be uh, where you draw the line between what needs to be punished and what needs encouragement for alternate behavior. <laughs> well said, okay. <laughs> so now turning it over to the audience, what are some of the in our small team, mm -hmm. 85 people, they just don't give a shit. Right. They, you can, <laughs> they, you, you can bring them in, you, we've tried, you know, the small groups, we've tried large groups, we've tried email awareness, and it's always the same people, it's always the same thing. How do you deal, how do you get them on board? <sighs> they don't, they don't care. It's like, yeah. You have to start off with, with what is essentially the core question of security awareness, right? 
it, it doesn't matter that it's a small group of people. It's one person or it's a, it, it's a core group that you need to get on board, yeah. buy into the problem, and change their behavior. Right. Short answer is, in my many, many years of experience, short answer is you need, you have a marketing and messaging problem. You need to get them to agree to what the problem is and to be participant in a solution. That is the underlying foundational problem that you got. It's not about education. It's not about you need to do, you need to do, and you need to do. Although that's also it's part of it. But what you what the, what's going to solve that particular problem is to say, do you agree that there's a problem? Do you agree that this behavior, this activity, isn't sustainable for you, your team, or the business? And if it continues, things are going to go wrong. First, do you buy into that? Do you understand that? Yes or no? Whatever that answer is, you, there's, you still need to move forward to say, what would you say a solution would be? Or here, industry solutions. Here, we're saying solutions. Does that going to work? Why, does it going to work for you? Yes or no? No. Why not? How can we make it work for you? What's going to work? Can you provide an alternate solution? Getting them to buy in to both the problem and the potential solutions and getting any amount of movement forward is going to be a win. Secondarily, and I realize I'm going to oh, no. need to wrap this up. Secondarily, ultimately, technical controls. If they refuse to buy in, refuse to be part of the solution, refuse to play ball in any way, shape, or form because they are C-suites, they are um, superstars in the company, they are high performers and they get to do whatever they want, the culture allows it, whatever that is, and yes, I'm seeing a lot of smiles, by the way, you don't see this, you see a lot of nods and smiles, whatever that is, then technical controls, lock them down. And you have to because the sustainability of the business requires it. Uh, you don't have the authority over your C-suite? Really? <laughs> huh. Well, I, well, I, 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 yes, so and I, I get it. The, I don't have the authority, nor do I have, like, I'm not in an IT position, so I can't just say, lock it down. Yep. As I said, you've got two options. Work with them. You've got a marketing yeah, messaging course. solution. Buy into the problem. Buy into a solution. It might not be the perfect solution. It may not be the solution that's in policy. A solution start the ball rolling, or technical controls. Okay. I um, am a teacher. I was a teacher before I got into IT. No, hey. And to address your concern, make, make it their problem by finding something they want that your requirements address. All right. I can do that. Okay, that's great. Now, a uh, couple of other points um, in terms of reference material. Uh, you mentioned a few things. Um, a very nice program, although it does cost, is Notice Board out of New Zealand. Uh, Noticeboard.com and board is spelled B O R E D. So you tell this is somebody who thinks about humor. Um, it gives you a wonderful package every month on a new topic, uh, slides for presentations, posters, slogans, uh, glossary, articles for newsletters, full newsletters, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it's okay. quite a complete package. Huge time saving. Uh, for, you know, any size, if you are a small business and, you know, can't deal with this, it's a complete package. Uh, other one? No offense to your book, because of course you're talking to us. Uh, Fred Cohen, all of, of his books are very strange. And when I first uh, read his on, on security training, I was thinking, where the heck is he coming from? And realized that he starts out talking like, you know, how to secure your purse at work, how to make sure your car doesn't get stolen, how to, you know. And all of a sudden realized, yes, of course, you know, this gives the employee something that they want and by the time you know they've gotten through that first bit then he starts bringing in things like passwords and etc mm -hmm. so securing the person mm -hmm. and if, if as, as you said hygiene starts at home you know it, it really does start there and then as it goes through the book gets into a very very extensive program and it's something that you actually 
give to your employees, not to us. Yeah. Written with the employee. Any other thoughts? Great. Yeah, just a, a, a question, I guess, because I know in talking to customers that one of the things they grapple with is how much information should they be giving to their employees about the actual security incidents that they're seeing. Because I think sometimes the reason that people don't comply is that they're in denial about the fact that it's even happening because a lot of the time they're not aware. And so there's a balancing act between how much do you tell people that you are being attacked and this is what's happening versus a concern about information getting out there. You know, media, we were talking about that this morning, that media can run away with that and be very damaging to the business. So how do you balance those things? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a balance between providing enough information to keep it fresh and keep it relevant, but not going so overboard so much that it, it becomes a problem. I was talking with someone today where they're so aware of the problem that they're like, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm going to get hacked anyway, so I'm just not going to bother with the inconvenience, right? Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to get hacked. So there is a messaging balance there. What I have done to solve this problem, and it's been a pretty effective rule of thumb for me, is to report on the attacks on senior management. And I will communicate this in the voice of senior management. Have a senior manager talk about, and I was fished this week. And this is what happened. This is what I did. This is how I responded. This is how I felt. Um, and this is how the IT security, the help desk, uh, uh, helped me through this. And so it provides several things. It says, yes, we're constantly under attack, even our management. Our management cares. Our, we have tone at the top. And it's not so much, like it's not every week, every day, but it's enough at enough of a slow drip to be relevant and fresh and impactful. And it's a story telling. It's a mm. one individual wanting, instead of this big, broad group somewhere, who is this really, oh, I know, you can actually walk up and talk to them about it. Yep. So is that, that's compelling. Thomas, on the other hand. Yeah. I wonder what your thoughts on materials built in-house yep. versus stuff that you get off the internet. I realize there's copyright. Sure. Sure. I'd hazard to say most of us aren't very good artists, so very humorous. But there's stuff on the internet that we know is funny. Yeah. What are your feelings about copying those things and putting them into your PowerPoints or your webinars and stuff like that? My, did you all catch that? Okay. My response is, is to be very careful that you don't cross the line to unintentioned cheesiness. That it's you're not using old jokes, old memes, old things, and you're coming off as goofy or cheesy, and it's not appropriate for the communication or what you're doing. Um, on the other hand, check your metrics. If you whatever you use, whether you've purchased a professional service, you've built everything in house, or you're stealing bits and pieces and clip art from uh, from the internet, what's the response? How, are pe how do people respond to it? What's their response? Do they remember? Uh, do they like it? What's their feedback? This should already be part of your metrics uh, matrix to see, OK, this material that I sent out this month, what was the general response? How many people came to me and you said, hey, you know that, that, that newsletter you sent out? I really like that. You should be keeping track of that kind of thing so that you can adjust your messaging as you go. And it's unique to the audience. Again, different people, different learning styles, different, uh, different mm. generations. So I think you really do need a kind of comprehensive uh, menu of items to, to be able to resonate with the different audiences. Yes? Uh, just with respect to that question, if you're using stuff off the internet, that's a legal question. So of course the answer is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> They're not as common or popular. Um, I happen to run a, a service called Selfish.com, um, and I'm Canadian. Um, it's non-commercial, by the way. It's not, it's not an ad for that. Um, you're right that that's a problem. The solution to that, and some of these companies will do this, is they'll, they'll provide an appliance. 
So you get to install an appliance in your environment, and it's done from there, so that everything is kept in-house in whatever your jurisdiction is. So you're not, it's not a software as a service, where a lot of them are. It's actually being done and generated from your local environment. You have a question about that? Sure. Yep. Yeah. I would happily talk with you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I would guess that that would be the best practice, and that's what you should be aiming to do, if I understood your question right, that uh, phishing test results, all of the metrics of a security awareness program, test results summarized over time should definitely be provided to the C-suite, to managers, to decision makers, to stakeholders who are in charge of maintaining the success and the budget of your security awareness program to make sure that they understand the effect of this security initiative, just like any security initiative. Or any initiative. Yeah. Anywhere dollars are going and showing those results is the, the right way to get more dollars. So if I've understood your question, now there's a flip side to your question. You're going to report that there's always going to be a positive click rate. That'll, in every report you're going to do, there's always going to be a positive click rate. And if you're asking, how do I report that we never get perfection to the C-suite? If that's the subtext to your question, the short answer is yes, of course, you have to, because you're never going to get to zero. Because it's not about perfection. It's not about getting to zero. It's not about making sure everybody's doing the right thing all the time. It's about risk, mitigation, and making sure processes are in place and we're maturing and getting better as we go. Now, I wanted to point to you um, briefly to this resource. Uh, we have Administrative Technology Innovation and Citizen Services. Amherst Burke was here last night kicking off this event, and of course, we're proud that they are sharing BC Aware Day here today. But they also have a number of resources here made in Canada. And if you, I haven't been through all of them, but there might be some uh, great ideas there for some Canadian content. So, again, this is big. You know, the whole, this is not simply a corporate problem or government problem, it's, it's a shared society issue, and this is not a, just at home or at work, you know, really it's a unifier. And when we think about BC Aware, that's you know, the breadth of the campaign, a lot of it comes from the very fact that every single one of us is touched by this, and we all kind of have a role to play. Any other questions? We're coming up to the end, so I want to make sure that if there's anything left, we will get that today. Educating employees, I think, is relatively easy. How do you have a chapter on educating parents? <laughs> there, <laughs> there are actually, there, there are actually books, uh, there are actually books dealing with that very topic, um, and yeah, that's that's a different scenario because the, the foundational technical understanding is different when you're dealing with parents, right? Um, so yes, there actually there are materials that actually help with that. Um, no, I haven't written any. Uh, <laughs> and it's not a problem. I, I could solve. I'm, I've come from a Mennonite background, so the technology my grandparents use is very different. <laughs> but I, just a comment about that. Tell us actually has a program called Tell Us Why. Mm -hmm. It's free in the community, um, and there's a number. There's ambassadors across the country uh, that are trained, and they will go into senior citizens' residents. They'll go into uh, community centers. They'll go into schools and talk about security awareness at a personal level, and it's very much geared to the audience. So they'll talk to parents of young children, they'll talk to elderly people in language that's appropriate and mm. that they understand, and same thing with children. Um, so if anybody's interested at all in that, either you know, for children or community groups or whatever, then you can, there's a specific person you contact to tell us, and she'll set you up with an ambassador in whatever community you need. And it's free. There's also mater Tell Us Wise material on the internet as well. Yes, yeah, there's a ton of it.
Please share and we'll make sure that you get your book and deck. Uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of the event.